Part 2. The Postman 1. Saturdays were for work, but Sundays were for walking. The walks had begun out of necessity five years ago, when he had moved to the city and knew little about it. Each week, he would choose a different neighborhood and walk from Lisbonard Street to it and then around it, covering its perimeter precisely and then home again. He never skipped a Sunday, unless the weather made it near impossible, and even now, even though he had walked every neighborhood in Manhattan, and many in Brooklyn and Queens as well, he still left every Sunday morning at ten and returned only when his route was complete. The walks had long ceased to be something he enjoyed, although he didn't not enjoy them either. It was simply something he did. For a period, he had also hopefully considered them something more than exercise, something perhaps restorative, like an amateur physical therapy session, despite the fact that Andy didn't agree with him, and indeed disapproved of his walks. I'm fine with your wanting to exercise your legs, he'd said. But in that case, you should really be swimming, not dragging yourself up and down pavement. He wouldn't have minded swimming, actually, but there was nowhere private enough for him to swim, and so he didn't. Willem had occasionally joined him on these walks, and now if his route took him past the theater, he would time it so they could meet at the juice stand down the block after the maintenance performance. They would have their drinks, and Willem would tell him how the show had gone, and would buy a salad to eat before the evening performance, and would continue south or toward home. They still lived at Lisbonar Street. Although both of them could have moved into their own apartments, he certainly, Willem probably, but neither of them had ever mentioned leaving to the other, and so neither of them had. They had, however, annexed the left half of the living room to make a second bedroom, the group of them building a lumpy sheet trucked wall one weekend. So now when you walked in, there was only the gray light from two windows, not four, to greet you. Willem had taken the new bedroom, and he had stayed in their old one. Aside from their stage door visits, it felt like he never saw Willem these days. And for all Willem talked about how lazy he was, it seemed he was constantly at work, or trying to work. Three years ago, on his 29th birthday, he had sworn that he was going to quit Orlan before he turned 30. And two weeks before his 30th birthday, the two of them had been in the apartment, squashed into their newly partitioned living room, Willem worrying about whether he could actually afford to leave his job, when he got a call. The call he had been waiting for years. The play that had resulted from that call had been enough of a success and had gotten Willem enough attention to allow him to quit Ordolan for good 13 months later, just one year past his self-imposed deadline. He had gone to see Willem's play, a family drama called the Malamud Theorem, about a literature professor in the early throes of dementia and his estranged son, a physicist, five times, twice with Malcolm and J.B., and once with Harold and Julia, who were in town for the weekend, and each time he managed to forget that it was his old friend, his roommate, on stage, and at curtain call, he had felt both proud and wistful, as if the stage's very elevation announced Willem's ascendancy to some other realm of life, one not easily accessible to him. His own approach to 30 had triggered no Latin in panic, no fluster of activity, no need to rearrange the outlines of his life to more closely resemble what a 30-year-old's life ought to be. The same was not true for his friends, however, and he had spent the last three years of his 20s listening to their eulogies for the decade and their detailing of what they had and hadn't done, and the cata cataloging of their self-loathing and promises. Things had changed then. The second bedroom, for example, was erected partly out of Willem's fear of being 28 and still sharing a room with his college roommate, and that same anxiety, the fear that, fairy tale like the turn into their fourth decade would transform them into something else, something out of their control, unless they preempted it with their own radical announcements, inspired Malcolm's hasty coming out to his parents, only to see him retreat back in the following year when he started dating a woman. But despite his friend's anxieties, he knew he would love being 30, for the very reason that they had hated it, because it was an age of undeniable adulthood. He looked forward to being 35 when he would be able to say he had been an adult for more than twice as long as he had been a child. When he was growing up, 30 had been a far-off, unimaginable age. He clearly remembered being a very young boy. This was when he lived in the monastery, and asking Brother Michael, who liked to tell him of the travels he had taken in his other life, when he too might be able to travel. When you're older, Brother Michael had said. When? He'd asked. Next year? Then, even a month had seemed as long as forever. Many years, Brother Michael had said. When you're older. When you're thirty. And now, in just a few weeks, he would be.
On those Sundays, when he was readying to leave for his walk, he would sometimes stand, barefoot, in the kitchen, everything quiet around him, and a small, ugly apartment would feel like a sort of marvel. Here, time was his, and space was his, and every door could be shut, every window locked. He would stand before the tiny hallway closet, inaclavarily over which they had stung a length of burlap, and admire the stores within it. At Lisbonard Street, there were no late-night scrambles to the bodega on West Broadway for a roll of toilet paper, no squinching your nose above a container of long-spoiled milk found in the back corner of the refrigerator. Here, there was always extra. Here, everything was replaced when it needed to be. He made sure of it. In their first year at Lisbonard Street, he had been self-conscious about his habits, which he knew belonged to someone much older and probably female, and had hidden his supplies of paper towels under his bed, had stuffed the flyers for coupons into his briefcase to look through later when Willem wasn't home, as if they were particularly, as if they were a particularly exotic form of pornography. But one day, Willem had discovered his stash while looking for a stray sock he'd kick under the bed. He had been embarrassed. Why? Willem asked him. I think it's great. Thank God you're looking out for this kind of stuff. But it had made him feel vulnerable, yet another piece of evidence added to the overstuffed file testifying to his pinched prissiness, his fundamental and irreparable inability to be the sort of person he tried to make people believe he was. And yet, as with so much else, he couldn't help himself. To whom could he explain that he found as much contentment and safety in unloved Lisbonard Street in his bomb shelter stockpilings as he did in the facts of his degrees and his job? or that those moments alone in the kitchen were something akin to meditative. The only times he found himself truly relaxing, his mind ceasing to scrabble forward, planning in advance thousands of little deflections and smudgings of truth, a fact that necessitated his every interaction with the world and its, and its inhabitants. To no one, he knew, not even Willem. But he'd had years to learn how to keep his thoughts to himself. Unlike his friends, he had learned not to share evidence of his oddities as a way to distinguish himself from others, although he was happy and proud that they shared theirs with him. Today, he would walk to the Upper East Side, up West Broadway to Washington Park, to University and through Union Square, and up Broadway to Fifth, which he'd stay on the 86th Street and then back down Madison to 24th Street, where he'd cross east to Lexington before continuing south and east once more to Irving, where he'd meet Willem outside the theater. It had been months, almost a year, since he had done this circuit, both because it was very far and because he had already spent every Saturday on the Upper East Side in a townhouse not far from Malcolm's parents, where he tutored a 12-year-old boy named Felix. But it was mid-March, spring break, and Felix and his family were on vacation in Utah, which meant he ran no risk of seeing them. Felix's father was a friend of friends of Malcolm's parents, and it had been Malcolm's father who had gotten him the job. They're really not paying you enough at the U.S. Attorney's Office, are they? Mr. Irvin had asked him. I don't know why you won't just let me introduce you to Gavin. Gavin was one of Mr. Irvin's law school friends, who now presided over one of the city's more powerful firms. Dad, he doesn't want to work for some corporate firm. Malcolm had begun, but his father continued talking as if Malcolm hadn't even spoken, and Malcolm had hunched back into his chair. He had felt bad for Malcolm then but also annoyed, as he had told Malcolm to discreetly inquire whether his parents knew anyone who might have a kid who needed t tutoring, not to actually ask them. Really, though, Malcolm's father had said to him, I think it's terrific that you're interested in making your way on your own. Malcolm slouched even lower in his seat. But do you really need the money that badly? I didn't think the federal government paid that miserably, but it's been a long time since I was in public service. He grinned. He smiled back. No, he said. The salary's fine. It was. It wouldn't have been to Mr. Irvin, of course, nor to Malcolm, but it was more money than he had ever dreamed he would have, and every two weeks it arrived, a relentless accumulation of numbers. I'm just saving for a down pavement. He saw Malcolm's face swivel toward him, and he reminded himself to tell Willem the particular lie he had told Malcolm's father before Malcolm told it Willem himself. Oh, well, good for you said Mr. Irvin. This was a goal he could understand. And as it happens, I know just the person. That person was Howard Baker, who had hired him after interviewing him for 15 distracting minutes to tutor his son in Latin, math, German, and piano. He wondered why Mr. Baker wasn't hiring professionals for each subject. He could have afforded it, but didn't ask. He felt sorry for Felix. 
who was small and unappealing, and who had a habit of scratching ins the inside of one narrow nostril, his index finger tunneling upward until he remembered himself and quickly retracted it, rubbing, on rubbing it on the side of his jeans. Eight months later, it was still unclear to him just how capable Felix was. He wasn't stupid, but he suffered from a lack of passion, as if at twelve, he had already become resigned to the fact that life would be a disappointment, and he a disappointment to the people in it. He was always waiting on time and with his assignments completed every Saturday at 1 p.m., and he obediently answered every question, his answers always ending in anxious, querying upper register as if every one, even the simplest, Sal, Felix, quedagis, um, bene, were a desperate guess, but he never had any questions of his own, and when he asked Felix if there was any subject in particular he might want to try discussing in either language, Felix would shrug and mumble, his finger drifting toward his nose. He always had the impression, when waving goodbye to Felix at the end of the afternoon, Felix listlessly raising his own hand before slouching back into the recesses of the entryway, that he, ha that he never left the house, never went out, never had friends over. Poor Felix. His very name was a taunt. The previous month, Mr. Baker had asked to speak to him after their lessons were over, and he had said goodbye to Felix and followed the maid into the study. His limp had been very pronounced that day, and he had been self-conscious, feeling, as he often did, as if he were playing the role of an impoverished governess in a Dickensian drama. He had expected impatience from Mr. Baker, perhaps anger, even though Felix was doing quantifiably better in school, and he was ready to, to defend himself if he needed. Mr. Baker paid far more than he had anticipated, and he had plans for the money he was earning there, but he was instead nodded toward the chair in the front of the desk. What do you think is wrong with Felix? Mr. Baker had demanded. He hadn't expected the question, so he had to think before he answered. I don't think anything's wrong with him, sir, he'd said carefully. I just think he's not... Happy, he nearly said. But what was happiness but an extravagance, an impossible state to maintain, partly because it was so difficult to articulate? He couldn't remember being a child and being able to define happiness. There was only misery, or fear, and the absence of misery, or fear. And the latter state was all he had needed or wanted. I think he's shy, he finished. Mr. Baker grunted. This was obviously not the answer he was looking for. But you like him, right? He'd asked him, with such an odd, vulnerable desperation that he experienced a sudden deep sadness, both for Felix and for Mr. Baker. Was this what being a parent was like? Was this what being a child with a parent was like? Such happiness, such disappointments, such expectations that would go unexpressed and unmet. Of course, he had said, and Mr. Baker had sighed and given him his check, which the maid usually handed to him on his way out. The next week, Felix hadn't wanted to play his assignment. He was more listless than usual. Shall we play something else? He'd asked. Felix had shrugged. He thought, Do you want me to play something for you? Felix had shrugged again, but he did anyway, because it was a beautiful piano, and sometimes, as he watched Felix inch his fingers across its lovely smooth keys, he longed to be alone with the instrument and let his hands move over its surface as fast as he could. He played Hayden, Sonata No. 5, in D major, one of his favorite pieces, and so bright and likable that he thought it might cheer them both up. But when he was finished and there was only the quiet boy sitting next to him, he was ashamed, both of the bra braggy, emphatic optimism of the Hayden and of his own burst of self-indulgence. Felix, he'd begun, and then stopped. Beside him, Felix waited. What's wrong? And then, to his astonishment, Felix had begun to cry, and he had tried to comfort him. Felix, he'd said, awkwardly putting his arm around him. He pretended he was Willem who would have known exactly what to do and what to say without even thinking about it. It's going to be all right. I promise you. It will be. But Felix had only cried harder. I don't have any friends, Felix had sobbed. Oh, Felix, he'd said, and his sympathy, with which until then had been of the remote, objective kind, clarified itself. I'm sorry. He felt then... Keenly, the loneliness of Felix's life, of a Saturday spent sitting with a crippled nearly 30-year-old lawyer who was there only to earn money, and who would go out that night with people he loved and who, even, loved him, while Felix remained alone, his mother, 
Mr. Baker's third wife, perpetually elsewhere. His father convinced there was something wrong with him, something that needed fixing. Later, on his walk home, if the weather was nice, he refused Mr. Baker's car and walked. He would wonder at the unlikely unfairness of it all. Felix, who's, who was by any definition a better kid than he had been, and who yet had no friends, and he, who was nothing, who did. Felix, it'll happen eventually, he'd said, and Felix had wailed. But when? With such yearning that he had winced. Soon, soon, he had told him, petting his skinny back. I promise. And Felix had nodded, although later, walking him to the door, his little gecko-y face made even more reptilian from tears. He'd had the distinct sensation that Felix had known he was lying. Who could know if Felix would ever have friends? Friendship, companionship, it so often defied logic, so often eluded the deserving, so often settled itself on the odd, the bad, the peculiar, the damaged. Waved goodbye at Felix's small back, retreating already into the house, and although he would have never said so to Felix, he somehow fancied that this was why Felix was wan all the time. It was because Felix had already figured this out long ago. It was because he already knew. He knew French and German. He knew the periodic table. He knew, as much as he didn't care to, large parts of the Bible almost by memory. He knew how to help birth a calf and rewire a lamp and unclog a drain, and the most efficient way to harvest a walnut tree, and which mushrooms were poisonous and which were not, and how to bale hay, and how to test a watermelon, an apple, a squash, a muskmelon for freshness by thunking it in the right spot. And then he knew things he wished he didn't, things he hoped never to have to use again, things that, when he thought of them or dreamed of them at night, made him curl into himself with hatred and shame. And yet it often seemed he knew nothing of any real value or use, not really. The languages and the math, fine, but daily he was reminded of how much he didn't know. He had never heard of the sitcoms whose episodes were constantly referenced. He had never been to a movie. He had never gone on vacation. He had never been to summer camp. He had never had pizza or popsicles or macaroni and cheese. And he had certainly never had, as both Malcolm and JB had, foie grass or sushi or marrow. He had never owned a computer or a phone. He had rarely been allowed to go online. He had never owned anything, he realized. Not really. The books he had that he was so proud of, the shirts that he repaired again and again, they were nothing. They were trash. The pride he took in them was more shameful than not owning anything at all. The classroom was the safest place, and the only place he felt fully confident. Everywhere else was an unceasing avalanche of marvels, each more baffling than the rest, each another reminder of his bottomless ignorance. He found himself keeping mental lists of new things he had heard and encountered. He could never ask anyone for answers. To do so would be an admission of extreme otherness, which would invite further questions and would leave him exposed, and which would inevitably lead to conversations he definitely was not prepared to have. He felt, often, not so much foreign, for even the foreign students, even Audville from a village outside Ulaanbaatar, seemed to understand these references, as from another time altogether. His, child, his childhood might as well have been spent in the 19th century, not the 21st, for all he had apparently missed, and for how obscure and merely decorative what he did know seemed to be. How was it that apparently all of his peers, whether they were born in Lagos or L.A., had had more or less of the same experience, the same cultural landmarks? Surely there was someone who knew as little as he did. And if not, how was he ever to catch up? In the evenings, when a group of them lay splayed in someone's room, a candle burning, a joint burning as well, the conversation often turned to his classmates' childhood, which they had barely left but about which they were curiously nostalgic and certainly obsessed. They recounted what seemed like every detail of them, though he was never sure if the goal was to compare with one another their similarities or to boast of their differences, because they seemed to take equal pleasure in both. They spoke of curfews and rebellions and punishments. A few people's parents had hit them, and they related these stories with something close to pride, which he also found curious, and pets and siblings and what they had warned that had driven their parents crazy and what groups they had hung out with in high school and to whom they had lost their virginity and where and how and cars they had crashed and bones they had broken and sports they had played and bands they had started. They spoke of disastrous family vacations and strange color relatives and odd next-door neighbors and teachers both beloved and loathed. 
He enjoyed these divulgences more than expected. These were real teenagers who'd had the sorts of real, plain lives he had always wondered about, and he found it both relaxing and educational to sit there late at night and listen to them. His silence was both a necessity and a protection, and had the added benefit of making him appear more mysterious and more interesting than he knew he was. What about you, Jude? A few people had asked him, early in the term, and he knew enough by then. He was a fast learner, to simply shrug and say with a smile, It's too boring to get into. He was astonished but relieved by how easily they accepted that, and grateful too for their self-absorption. None of them really wanted to listen to someone else's story anyway. They only wanted to tell their own. And yet his silence did not go unnoticed by everyone, and it was his silence that had inspired his nickname. This was the year Malcolm discovered postmodernism, and J.B. had made such a fuss about how late Malcolm was to a particular ideology that he hadn't admitted that he hadn't heard of it either. You can't just decide you're post-black, Malcolm, J.B. had said. And also, you have to have actually been black to begin with in order to move beyond blackness. You're such a dick, J.B., Malcolm had said. Or, J.B. had continued, you have to be so genuinely uncategorizable that the normal terms of identity don't even apply to you. JB had turned toward him, then, and he had felt himself freeze with a momentary terror. Like Judy here, we never see him with anyone. We don't know what race he is. We don't know anything about him. Post-sexual, post-racial, post-identity, post-past. He smiled at him, presumably to show he was at least partly joking. The postman. Jude, the postman. The postman, Malcolm had repeated. He was never above grabbing onto someone else's discomfort as a way of deflecting attention from his own. And although the name didn't stick, when Willem had returned to the room and heard it, he had only rolled his eyes in response, which seemed to remove some of its thrill for JB. He was reminded that as much as he had convinced himself he was fitting in, as much as he worked to conceal the spiky, odd parts of himself, he was fooling no one. They knew he was strange, and now his foolishness extended to his having convinced himself that he had convinced them that he wasn't. Still, he kept attending the late-night groups, kept joining his classmate in their rooms. He was pulled to them, even though he knew he was putting himself in jeopardy by attending them. Sometimes, during these sessions, he had begun to think of them this way, as intensive tutorials in which he could correct his own cultural paucities. He would catch Willem watching him with an indecipherable expression on his face and would wonder how much Willem might have guessed about him. Sometimes he had to stop himself from saying something to him. Maybe he was wrong, he sometimes thought. Maybe it would be nice to confess to someone that most of the time he could barely relate to what was being discussed, that he couldn't participate in everyone else's shared language of childhood pratfuls and frustrations. But then he would stop himself for admitting ignorance of that language would mean having to explain the one he did speak. Although if he were to tell anyone, he knew it would be Willem. He admired all three of his roommates, but Willem was the one he trusted. At the home, he had quickly learned there were three types of boys. The first type might cause the fight, this was JB. The second type wouldn't join in but wouldn't run to get help, either, this was Malcolm. And the third type would actually try to help you, this was the rarest type, and this was obviously Willem. Maybe it was the same with girls as well, but he hadn't spent enough time around girls to know this for sure. And increasingly, he was certain Willem knew something. Knows what? He'd argue with himself, in saner moments. You're just looking for a reason to tell him. And then what? What will he think of you then? Be smart. Say nothing. Have some self-control. But this was, of course, illogical. He knew even before he got to college that his childhood had been atypical, you had only to read a few books to come to that conclusion, but it wasn't until recently that he had realized how atypical it truly was. Its very strangeness both insulated and isolated him. It was near inconceivable that anyone would guess at its shape and specificities, which meant that if they did, it was because he had dropped clues like cow like cow turds, gray, ugly, unmissable pleas for attention. Still, the suspicion persisted sometimes with an uncomfortable intensity, as if it was inevitable that he should say something and was being sent messages that took more energy to ignore than they would have to obey. One night, it was just the four of them. This was early in their third year and was unusual enough for, the, for them all to feel cozy and a little sentimental about the clique they had made. And they were a clique. And to his surprise, he was part of it. 
The building they lived in was called Hood Hall, and they were known around campus as the Boys in the Hood. All of them had other friends, JB and Willem had the most, but it was known, or at least assumed, which was just as good, that their first loyalties were to one another. None of them have, had ever discussed this explicitly, but they all knew they liked this assumption, that they liked this code of friendship that had been imposed upon them. The food that night had been pizza, ordered by JB and paid for by Malcolm. There had been weed procured by JB, and outside there had been rain and then hail, the sound of it cracking against the glass, and the wind rattling the windows in their splintered wooden casements, the final elements in their happiness. The joint went round and round, and although he didn't take a puff, he never did. He was too worried about what he might do or say if he lost control over himself. He could feel the smoke filling his eyes, pressing upon his eyelids like a shaggy, warm beast. He had been careful, as he always was when one of the others paid for food, to eat as little as possible, and although he was still hungry, there were two slices left over and he stared at them fixedly before catching himself and turning away resolutely. He was also deeply content. I could fall asleep, he thought, and stretched out on the couch, pulling Malcolm's blanket over him as he did. He was pleasantly exhausted, but then he was always exhausted those days. It was as if the daily effort it took to appear normal was so great that it left energy for little else. He was aware, sometimes, of seeming wooden, icy, of being boring, which he recognized that here might have been considered the greater misfortune than being whatever it was he was. In the background, as if far away, he could hear Malcolm and JB having a fight about evil. I'm just saying we wouldn't be having this argument if you read Plato. Yeah, but what Plato? Have you read Plato? I don't see... Have you? No, but... See? 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 That would be Malcolm, jumping up and down and pointing at JB while Willem laughed. On weed, Malcolm grew both sillier and more pedantic, and the three of them liked getting into silly and pedantic philosophical arguments with him, the contents of which Malcolm could never recall in the morning. Then there was an interlude of Willem and JB talking about something. He was too sleepy to really listen, just awake enough to distinguish their voices. And then JB's voice, ringing through his fug. Jude! What? He answered, his eyes still closed. I want to ask you a question. He could, f he could instantly feel something inside him come alert. When high, JB had the uncanny ability to ask questions or make observations that both devastated and discomfited. He didn't think there was any malice behind it. But it made you wonder what went on in JB's subconscious. Was this the real JB? The one who had asked their hallmate, Trisha Park, what it was like growing up as the ugly twin? Poor Trisha had gotten up and run out of the room. Or was it the one who, after JB had witnessed him in the grip of a terrible episode, one in which he could feel himself falling in, in and out of consciousness, the sensation in, the sensa the sensation as sickening as tumbling off a roller coaster in mid-incline, had snuck out that night with his stoner boyfriend and returned just before Drape daybreak with a bundle of bud furred magnolia branches sawn off illegally from the quadrilingo trees what he asked again warily well said jb pausing and taking another inhalation we've all known each other for a while now who we have willem asked in a fake surprise shut up willem jb continued and all of us want to know why you've never told us what happened to your legs oh jb we do not Willem began, but Malcolm, who had the habit of vociferously taking J.B.'s side when Stone interrupted him, It really hurts our feelings, Jude. Do you not trust us? Jesus, Malcolm, Willem said, and then mimicking Malcolm in a shrieky falsetto, It really hurts our feelings. You sound like a girl. It's Jude's business. And this was worse, somehow, having to have Willem, always Willem, defend him, against Malcolm and J.B., at that moment, he hated all of them, but of course he was in no position to hate them. They were his friends, his first friends, and he understood that friendship was a series of exch exchanges, of affections, of time, sometimes of money, always of information. And he had no money. He had nothing to give them. He had nothing to offer. He couldn't loan Willem a sweater, the way Willem let him borrow his, or repay Malcolm the hundred dollars he'd pressed upon him once, or even help JB on move-out day, as JB helped him. Well, he began, and was aware of all of their perked silences, even Willem's. It's not very interesting. He kept his eyes closed, both because it made it easier to tell the story when he didn't have to look at them, and also because he simply didn't think he could stand it at the moment. 
It was a car injury. I was 15. It was the year before I came here. Oh, said JB. There was a pause. He could feel something in the room deflate. Could feel how his revelation had shifted the others back into a sort of somber sobriety. I'm sorry, bro. That sucks. You could walk before? Asked Malcolm, as if he could not walk now. And this made him sad and embarrassed. While he considered walking, they apparently did not. Yes, he said. And then because it was true, even if not the way they'd interpret it, he added, I used to run cross-country. Oh, wow, said Malcolm. JB had made a sympathetic running noise. Only Willem, he noticed, said nothing, but he didn't dare open his eyes to look at his expression. Eventually, the word got out, as he knew it would. Perhaps people really did wonder about his legs. Trisha Park later came up to him and told him she'd always assumed he had cerebral palsy. What was he supposed to say to that? Somehow, though, over the tellings and retellings, the explanation was changed to a car accident and then to a drunken driving accident. The easiest explanations are often the right ones, his math professor, Dr. Lee, always said, and maybe the same principle applied here, except he knew it didn't. Math was one thing. Nothing else was that reductive. But the odd thing was this. By his story morphing into one about a car accident, he was being given an opportunity for reinvention. All he had to do was claim it. But he never could. He could never call it an accident, because it wasn't. And so was it pride or stupidity to not take the escape route he'd, op he'd been offered? He didn't know. And then he noticed something else. He was in the middle of another episode, a highly humiliating one. It had taken place just as he was coming off of his shift at the library, and Willem had just happened to be there a few minutes early, about to start his own shift, when he heard the librarian, a kind, well-read woman whom he liked, ask why he had these. They had moved him, Mrs. Ikali and Willem, to the break room in the back, and he could smell the burnt sugar tang of old coffee, a scent he despised anyway. So sharp and assaultive that he almost vomited. A car injury, he heard Willem's reply as from across a great black lake. But it wasn't until that night that he had registered what Willem had said, and the word he had used, injury, not accident. Was it deliberate, he wondered? What did Willem know? He was so addled that he might have actually asked him had Willem been around, but he wasn't. He was at his girlfriend's. No one was there, he realized. The room was his. He felt a creature inside him, which he pictured as slight and raggedy and lemur-like, quick reflexed and ready to sprint, its dark wet eyes forever scanning the landscape for future dangers, relax, and sag to the ground. It was at these moments that he found college most enjoyable. He was in a warm room, and the next day, he would have three meals and eat as much as he wanted. And in between, he would go to classes, and no one would try to hurt him or make him do anything he didn't want to do. Somewhere nearby were his roommates, his friends, and he had survived another day without divulging any of his secrets, and placed another day between the person he once was and the person he was now. It seemed always an accomplishment worthy of sleep. And so he did, closing his eyes and readying himself for another day in the world. It had been Anna, his first and only social worker, and the first person who had never betrayed him, who had talked to him seriously about college, the college he ended up attending, and who was convinced that he would get in. She hadn't been the first person to suggest this, but she had been the most insistent. I don't see why not, she said. It was a favorite phrase of hers. The two of them were sitting on Anna's porch, in Anna's backyard, eating banana bread that Anna's girlfriend had made. Anna didn't care for nature, too buggy, too squirmy, she always said. But when he made the suggestion that they go outdoors, tentatively, because at the time he was still unsure where the boundaries of her tolerance for him lay, she'd slapped the edges of her armchair and heaved herself up. I don't see why not. Leslie! She called into the kitchen, where Leslie was making lemonade. You can bring it outside. Hers was the first face he saw when he had at last opened his eyes in the hospital. For a long moment, he couldn't remember where he was, or who he was, or what had happened. And then, suddenly, her face was above his, looking at him. Well, well, she said. He awakes. She was always there, it seemed, no matter what time he woke. Sometimes it was day, and he heard the sounds of the hospital, the mouse squeak of the nurse's shoes, and the clatter of a cart, and the drone of the intercom announcements, in the hazy, half-formed moments he had before shifting into full consciousness. But sometimes it was night, when everything was silent around him, 
and it took him longer to figure out where he was and why he was there, although it came back to him. It always did. And unlike some realization, it never grew easier or fuzzier with each remembrance. And sometimes it was neither day nor light, but somewhere in between. And there would be something strange and dusty about the light that made him imagine for a moment that there might be, after all, such a thing as heaven, and that he might, after all, have made it there. And then he would hear Anna's voice, and remember again why he was there, and want to close his eyes all over again. They talked of nothing in those moments. She would ask him if he was hungry, and no matter his answer, she would have a sandwich for him to eat. She would ask him if he was in pain, and if he was, how intense it was. It was in her presence that he'd had his first of his episodes, and the pain had been so awful, unbearable almost, as if someone had reached in and grabbed his spine like a snake and was trying to loose it from its bundle of nerves by shaking it. That later, when the surgeon told him that an injury like this was an insult to the body, and one that the body would never recover from completely, he, un he had understood what the word meant and realized how correct and well-chosen it was. You mean, he's going to have these all his life? Anna had asked, and he had been grateful for her outrage, especially because he was too tired and frightened to summon forth any of his own. I wish I could say no, said the surgeon. And then to him, But they may not be severe in the future. You're young now. The spine has wonderful reparative qualities. Jude, she'd said to him when the next one came, two days after the first. He could hear her voice, but as if from far away, and then, suddenly, awfully close, filling his mind like explosions. Hold on to my hand, she'd said, and again her voice swelled and receded, but she seized his hand and he held it so tightly he could feel her index finger slide oddly over her ring finger, could almost feel every small bone in her palm reposition themselves in his grip, which had the effect of making her seem like something delicate and intricate, although there was nothing delicate about her in either appearance or manner. Count! She commanded him the third time it happened, and he did, counting up to a hundred, again and again, parsing the pain into negotiable increments. In those days, before he learned it was better to be still, he would flop on his bed like a fish on a boat deck, his free hand scrabbling for a halyard line to cling to for safety, the hospital mattress unyielding and uncaring, searching for a position in which discomfort might lessen. He tried to be quiet but he could hear himself making strange animal noises, so that at times a forest appeared beneath his eyelids, populated with screech owls and deer and bears, and he would imagine he was one of them, and that the sounds he was making were normal, part of the woods and seizing soundtrack. When they had ended, she would give him some water, a straw in the glass so he wouldn't have to raise his head. Beneath him, the floor tilted and bucked, and he was often sick. He had never been in the ocean, but he imagined this is what it might feel like. Imagined the swells of the water forcing the linoleum floor into quavering hillocks. Good boy, she'd said as he drank. Have a little more. It'll get better, she'd said. And he'd nod, because he couldn't begin to imagine his life if it didn't get better. His days now were hours, hours without pain and hours with it, and the unpredictability of the schedule, and his body, although it was his in name only, for he could control nothing of it, exhausted him, and he slept and slept, the day slipping away from him, uninhabited. Later, it would be easier to simply tell people that it was his legs that hurt him, but that wasn't really true, it was his back. Sometimes he could predict what would trigger the spasming, that pain that would extend down his spine into one leg or the other, like a wooden stake set aflame and thrust into him, a certain movement lifting something too heavy or too high, simple tiredness. But sometimes he couldn't. And sometimes the pain would be preceded by an interlude of numbness or a twinging that was almost pleasurable. It was so light and singy, just a sensation of electric prickles moving up and down his spine, and he would know to lie down and wait for it to finish its cycle, a penance he could never escape or avoid. But sometimes it barged in, and those were the worst. He grew fearful that it would arrive at some terribly inopportune time. And before each big meeting, each big interview, each court appearance, he would beg his own back to still itself, to carry him through the next few hours without incident. But all of this was in the future, and each lesson he learned he did so over hours and hours of these episodes, stretched out over days and months and years. As the weeks passed, she brought him books and told him to write down titles he was interested in, and she would go to the library and get them, but he was too shy to do so. He knew she was his social worker and that she had been assigned to him, 
but it wasn't until more than a month had passed and the doctors had begun to talk about his cast being removed in a matter of weeks that she first asked him what had happened. I don't remember, he said. It was his default answer for everything back then. It was a lie as well. In uninvited moments, he'd see the car's headlights, twin glares of white, rushing toward him, and recall how he'd shut his eyes and jerked his head to the side, as if that might have prevented the inevitable. She waited. It's okay, Jude, she said. We basically know what happened, but I need you to tell me at some point so we can talk about it. She had interviewed him earlier. Did he remember? There had apparently been a moment soon after he'd come out of the first surgery that he had awoken, lucid, and answered all her questions, not only about what had happened that night, but in the years before it as well. But he honestly didn't remember this at all, and he fretted about what exactly he had said, and what Anna's expression had been when he'd told her. How much had he told her? He asked at one point. Enough, she said, to convince me that there's a hell, and those men need to be in it. She didn't sound angry, but her words were, and he closed his eyes, impressed and a little scared that the things that had happened to him, to him, could inspire such passion, such vitriol. She oversaw his transfer into his new home, his final home, the Douglases. They had two other fosters, both girls, both young. Rosie was eight and had Down syndrome. Agnes was nine and had spina bifida. The house was a maze of ramps, unlovely but sturdy and smooth. And unlike Agnes, he could wheel himself around without asking for assistance. The Douglases were evangelical Lutherans, but they didn't make him attend church with them. They are good people, Anna said. They won't bother you, and you'll be safe here. You think you can manage Grace at the table for a little privacy and guaranteed security? She looked at him and smiled. He nodded. Besides, she continued, you can always call me if you want to talk sin. And indeed, he was in Anna's care more than in the Douglases. He slept in their house and ate there, and when he was first learning how to move on his crutches, it was Mr. Douglas who sat on the chair outside the bathroom, ready to enter if he slipped and fell, getting into or out of the bathtub. He still wasn't able to balance well enough to take a shower, even with a walker. But it was Anna who took him to most of his doctor's appointments, and Anna who waited at one end of her backyard, a cigarette in her mouth, as he took his first slow steps toward her, and Anna who finally got him to write down what had happened with Dr. Trailer and kept him from having to testify in court. He had said he could do it, but she had told him he wasn't ready yet, and that they had plenty of evidence to put Dr. Trailer away for years even without his testimony, and hearing that, he was able to admit his own relief. Relief at not having to say aloud words he didn't know how to say, and mostly relief that he wouldn't have to see Dr. Trailer again. When he at last gave her the statement, which he'd written as plainly as possible and had imagined while writing it that he was in fact writing about someone else, someone he had known once but had never had to talk to again, she read it through once in passive before nodding at him. Good, she said briskly and refolded it and placed it back in its envelope. Good job, she added, and then suddenly she began to cry, almost ferociously, unable to stop herself. She was saying something to him. But she was weeping so hard he couldn't understand her, and she had finally left, though she had called him later that night to apologize. I'm sorry, Jude, she said. That was really unprofessional of me. I just read what you wrote and I just... She was silent for a period and then took a breath. It won't happen again. It was also Anna who, after the doctors determined he wouldn't be strong enough to go to school, found him a tutor so he could finish high school, and it was she who made him discuss college. You're really smart, did you know that? She asked him. You could go anywhere, really. I talked to some of your teachers in Montana, and they think so as well. Have you thought about it? You have? Where would you want to go? And when he told her, preparing himself for her to laugh, she instead only nodded. I don't see why not. But, he began, do you think they'd take someone like me? Once again, she didn't laugh. It's true, you haven't had the most traditional of educations she smiled at him but your tests are terrific and although you probably don't think so i promise you you know more than most if not all kids your age she sighed you may have something to thank brother luke for after all she studied his face so i don't see why not she helped him with everything 
She wrote one of his recommendations. She let him use her computer to type his essay. He didn't write about the past year. He wrote about Montana and how he'd learned there to forage for mustard shoots and mushrooms. She even paid for his application fee. When he was accepted, with a full scholarship, as Anna had predicted, he told her it was all because of her. Bullshit, she said. She was so sick by that point that she could only whisper it. You did it yourself. Later, he would scan through the previous months and see, as if spotlit, the signs of her illness and how, in his stupidity and self-absorption, he had missed one after the next, her weight loss, her yellowing eyes, her fatigue, all of which he had attributed to what? You shouldn't smoke, he said to her just two months earlier, confident enough around her now to start issuing orders, the first adult he'd done so to. You're right she'd said, and squinted her eyes at him while inhaling deeply, grinning at him when he sighed at her. Even then, she didn't give up. Dude, we should talk about it. She'd say every few days, and when he shook his head, she'd be silent. Tomorrow, then, she'd say. Do you promise me? Tomorrow we'll talk about it? I don't see why I have to talk about it at all, he muttered at her once. He knew she had read his records from Montana. He knew she knew what he was. She was quiet. One thing I've learned, she said, you have to talk about these things while they're still fresh, or you'll never talk about them. I'm going to teach you how to talk about them, because it's going to get harder and harder the longer you wait, and it's going to fester inside you, and you're always going to think you're to blame. You'll be wrong, of course, but you'll always think it. He didn't know how to respond to that, but the next day, when she brought it up again, he shook his head and turned away from her, even though she called after him. Jude, she'd said once, I've let you go on for too long without addressing this. This is my fault. Do it for me, Jude, she said at another point, but he couldn't. He couldn't find the language to talk about it, not even to her. Besides, he didn't want to relive those years. He wanted to forget them, to pretend they belonged to someone else. By June, she was so weak she couldn't sit. Fourteen months after they'd met, she was the one in bed, and he was the one next to her. Leslie worked the day shift at the hospital, and so often, it was just the two of them in the house. Listen, she said. Her throat was dry from one of her medications, and she winced as she spoke. He reached for the jug of water, but she waved her hand, impatiently. Leslie's going to take you shopping before you leave. I made a list for her of things you'll need. He started to protest, but she stopped him. Don't argue, Jude. I don't have the energy. She swallowed. He waited. You're going to be great at college, she said. She shut her eyes. The other kids are going to want to know about you and how you grew up. Have you thought about that? Sort of, he said. It was all he thought about. Mm-hmm, she grunted. She didn't believe him either. What are you going to tell them? And then she opened her eyes and looked at him. I don't know, he admitted. Ah, uh, yes, she said. They were quiet. Jude, she began, and then stopped. You'll find your own way to discuss what happened to you. You'll have to, if you ever want to be close to anyone. But your life, no matter what you think, you have nothing to be ashamed of, and none of this has been your fault. Will you remember that? It was the closest they had ever gotten to discussing not only the previous year, but the years that preceded it, too. Yes, he told her. She glared at him. Promise me. I promise. But even then, he couldn't believe her. She sighed. I should have made you talk more, she said. It was the last thing she ever said to him. Two weeks later, July 3rd, she was dead. Her service was the week after that. By this point, he had a summer job at a local bakery, where he sat in the back room spackling cakes with fondant, and in the days following the funeral, he sat until night at his workstation, plastering cake after cake with carnation pink icing, trying not to think of her. At the end of July, the Douglases moved. Mr. Douglas had gotten a new job in San Jose, and they were taking Agnes with them. Rosie was being reassigned to a different family. He had liked the Douglases, but when they told him to stay in touch, he knew he wouldn't. He was so desperate to move away from the life he was in, the life he'd had. He wanted to be someone whom no one knew and who knew no one. He was put into emergency shelter. That was what the state called it, emergency shelter. He'd argued that he was old enough to be left on his own, 
He imagined, also illogically, that he would sleep in the back room of the bakery, and that in less than two months he'd be gone away, out of the system entirely, but no one agreed with him. The shelter was a dormitory, a sagging gray honeycomb populated by other kids who, because of what they had done or what had been done to them or simply how old they were, the state couldn't easily place. When it was time for him to leave, they gave him some money to buy supplies for school. They were, he recognized, vaguely proud of him. He might not have been in the system for long, but he was going to college, and to a superior college at that. He would forever after be claimed as one of their successes. Leslie drove him to the Army-Navy store. He wondered, as he chose things he thought he might need, two sweaters, three long sleeve shirts, pants, a gray blanket that resembled the cloddy stuffing that vomited forth from the sofa in the shelter's lobby, if he was getting the correct things, the things that might have been on Anna's list. He couldn't stop himself from thinking that there was something else on that list, something essential that Anna, ne Anna thought he needed, that he would now never know. At nights, he craved that list sometimes more than he craved her. He could picture it in his mind, the funny up-and-down capitalizations she inserted into a single word, the mechanical pencil she always used, the yellow legal pads left over from her years as a lawyer, on which she made her notes. Sometimes the letters solidified into words, and in the dream life he'd feel triumphant. Ah, he'd think, of course. Of course that's what I need. Of course Anna would know. But in the mornings, he could never remember what those things were. In those moments, he wished, perversely, that he had never met her, that it was surely worse to have had her for so brief a period than to never have had her at all. They gave him a bus ticket north. Leslie came to the station to see him off. He had packed his things in a double-layered black garbage bag and then inside the backpack he'd bought at the Army-Navy store, everything he owned in one neat package. On the bus, he stared out the window and thought of nothing. He hoped his back wouldn't betray him on the ride, and it didn't. He had been the first to arrive in their room, and when the second boy came in, it had been Malcolm, with his parents and suitcases and books and speakers and television and phones and computers and refrigerator and flotillas of digital gadgetry. He had felt the first sensations of sickening fear, and then anger, directed irrationally at Anna. How could she let him believe he might be equipped to do this? Who could say he was? Why had she never told him exactly how poor, how ugly, what a scrap of bloodied, muddied cloth his life really was? Why had she let him believe he might belong here? As the months passed, this feeling dampened, but it never disappeared. It lived on him like a thin scum of mold. But as that knowledge became more acceptable, another piece became less so. He began to realize that she was the first and last person to whom he would never have to explain anything. She knew that he wore his life on his skin, that his biography was written in his flesh and on his bones. She would never ask him why he wouldn't wear short sleeves, even in the steamiest of weather, or why he didn't like to be touched, or, most important, what had happened to his legs or back. She knew already. Around her he had felt none of the constant anxiety nor watchfulness that he seemed condemned to feel around everyone else. The vigilance was exhausting, but eventually became simply a part of life, a habit like good posture. Once, she had reached out to, he later realized, embrace him, but he had re reflexively brought his hands up over his head to protect himself, and although he had been embarrassed, she didn't make him feel silly or overreactive. Uh, I'm an idiot, dude. She'd said instead, I'm sorry, no more sudden movements, I promise. But now she was gone, and no one knew him. His records were sealed. His first Christmas, Leslie had sent him a card, addressed to him through the student affairs office, and he had kept it for days, his last link to Anna, before finally throwing it away. He never wrote back, and never heard from Leslie again. It was a new life. He was determined not to ruin it for himself. Still, sometimes, he thought back to their final conversations, mouthing them out loud. This was at night, when his roommates, in various configurations, depending on who was in the room at that time, slept above and next to him. Don't let the silence become a habit, she'd warned him shortly before she died, and, it's all right to be angry, Jude. You don't have to hide it. She had been wrong about him, he always thought. He wasn't what she thought he was. You're destined for greatness, kid, she'd said once, and he wanted to believe her.
even though he couldn't. But she was right about one thing. It did get harder and harder. He did blame himself. And although he tried every day to remember the promise he'd made to her, every day it became more and more remote until it was just a memory, and so was she, a beloved character from a book he'd read long ago. The world has two kinds of people, Judge Sullivan used to say, those who are inclined to believe and those who aren't. In my courtroom, we value belief, belief in all things. He made this proclamation often, and after doing so, he would groan himself to his feet. He was very fat and toddled out of the room. This was usually at the end of the day, Sullivan's day at least, when he left his chambers and came over to speak to his law clerks, sitting on the edge of one of their desks and delivering often opaque lectures that were interspersed with frequent pauses, as if his clerks were not lawyers but scriveners and should be writing down his words. But no one did, not even Kerrigan, who was a true believer and the most conservative of the three of them. After the judge left, he would grin across the room at Thomas, who would raise his eyes upward in a gesture of helplessness and apology. Thomas was a conservative too, but a thinking conservative, he'd remind him. And the fact that I even have to make that distinction is fucking depressing. He and Thomas had started clerking for the judge the same year, and when he had been approached by the judge's informal search committee, really his business association's professor with whom the judge was old friends, the spring of his second year of law school, it had been Harold who had encouraged him to apply. Sullivan was known among his fellow circuit court judges for always hiring one clerk whose political views diverged from his own. The more wildly, the better. His last liberal law clerk had gone on to work for a Hawaiian rights sovereignty group that advocated for the island's secession from the United States, a career move that had sent the judge into a fit of apoplectic self-satisfaction. Sullivan hates me, Harold had told him then, sounding pleased. He'll hire you just to spite me, he smiled, savoring the thought. And because you're the most brilliant student I've ever had, he added. The compliment made him look at the ground. Harold's praise tended to be conveyed to him by others and was rarely handed to him directly. I'm not sure I'm liberal enough for him, he would replied. Certainly he wasn't liberal enough for Harold. It was one of the things, his opinions, the way he read the law, how he applied it to life, that they argued about. Harold snorted. Trust me, he said, you are. But when he went to Washington for his interview that following year, Sullivan had talked about the law and political philosophy with much less vigor and specificity than he had anticipated. I hear that you sing, Sullivan said instead after an hour of conversation about what he had studied, the judge had attended at same law school, and his position as the article's editor on the law review, the same position the judge himself had held, and his thoughts on recent cases... I do, he replied, wondering how the judge had learned that. Singing was his comfort, but he rarely did it in front of others. Had he been singing in Harold's office and been overheard? Or sometimes he sang in the library, when he was reshelving books late at night, and the space was as quiet and still as church. Had someone overheard him there? Sing me something, said the judge. What would you like to hear, sir? he asked. Normally, he would have been much more nervous but he had heard that the judge would make him do a performance of some sort. Legend had it he'd made a previous applicant juggle, and Sullivan was, was a known opera lover. The judge put his fat fingers to his fat lips and thought, Hmm, he said. Sing me something that tells me something about you. He thought and then sang. He was surprised to hear what he chose. Mahler's Ichipin der Welt abenden Kekumen. Both because he didn't even really like Mahler, that much, and because the light was a difficult one to perform, slow and mournful and subtle, and not meant for a tenor. And yet he liked the poem itself, which his voice teacher in college had dismissed as second-rate romanticism, but which he had always thought suffered unfairly from a poor translation. The standard interpretation of the first line was, I am lost to the world, but he read it as, I have become lost to the world which he believed was less self-pitying, less melodramatic, and more resigned, more confused. I have become lost to the world in which I otherwise wasted so much time. The lied was about the life of an artist, which he was definitely not. 
but he understood primarily almost the concept of losing, of losing oneself from the world, of disappearing into a different place, one of retreat and safety, of the twin yearnings of escape and discovery. It means nothing to me. Whether the world believes me dead, I can hardly say anything to refute it, for truly, I am no longer a part of the world. When he finished, he opened his eyes to the judge, clapping and laughing. Bravo, he said. Bravo. But I think you might be in the wrong profession altogether, you know. He laughed again. Where'd you learn to sing like that? The brothers, sir, he replied. Ah, a Catholic boy? asked the judge, sitting up flatly in his chair and looking ready to be pleased. I was raised Catholic, he began. But you're not now? the judge asked, frowning. No, he said. He had worked for years to keep the apology out of his voice when he said this. Sullivan made a noncommittal grinning noise. Well, whatever they give you, you should have offered at least some sort of protection against whatever Harold Stein's been filling your head with for the past few years, he said. He looked at his resume. You're his research assistant? Yes, he said. For more than two years. A good mind wasted, Sullivan declared. It was unclear whether he meant the his or Harold's. Thanks for coming down. We'll be in touch. And thanks for the lied. You have one of the most beautiful tenors I've heard in a long time. Are you sure you're in the right field? At this, he smiled, the last time he would ever see Sullivan smile with such pleasure and sincerity. Back in Cambridge, he told Harold about his meeting. You sing? Harold asked him, as if he just told him he flew, but that he was certain he wouldn't get the clerkship. A week later, Sullivan called. The job was his. He was surprised, but Harold wasn't. I told you so, he said. The next day, he went to Harold's office as usual, but Harold had his coat on. Normal work is suspended today, he announced. I need you to run some errands with me. This was unusual, but Harold was unusual. At the curb, he held out the keys. Do you want to drive? Sure, he said, and went to the driver's side. This was the car he'd learned to drive in just a year ago, while Harold sat next to him, far more patient outside the classroom than he was in it. Good, he'd said. Let go of the clutch a little more. Good. Good, Jude. Good. Harold had to pick up some shirts he had altered, and they drove to the small, expensive men's store on the edge of the square where Willem had worked his senior year. Come with me, Harold instructed him. I'm going to need help carrying these out. My God, Harold, how many shirts did you buy? He asked. Harold had an unvarying wardrobe of blue shirts, white shirts, brown corduroys for winter, linen pants for spring and summer, and sweaters in various shades of greens and blues. Quiet, you, said Harold. Inside, Harold went off to find a salesperson, and he waited, running his fingers over the ties in their display cases, rolled and shiny as pastries. Malcolm had given him two of his old cotton suits, which he'd had tailored and had worn throughout both of his summer internships, but he'd had to borrow his roommate's suit for the Sullivan interview, and he had tried to move carefully in it the entire time it was his, aware of its largeness and fineness of the wool. Then, that's him he heard Harold say, and when he turned, Harold was standing with a small man who had a measuring, ta me measuring tape draped around his neck like a snake. He'll need two suits, a dark gray and a navy. And let's get him a dozen shirts, a few sweaters, some ties, socks, shoes. He doesn't have anything. To him, he nodded and said, this is Marco. I'll be back in a couple of hours or so. Wait, he said, Harold, what are you doing? Jude, said Harold, you need something to wear. I'm hardly an expert on this front, but you can't show up to Sullivan's chambers wearing what you're wearing. He was embarrassed by his clothes, by his inadequacy, by Harold's generosity. I know, he said, but I can't accept this, Harold. He would have continued, but Harold stepped between him and Marco and turned him away. Jude, he said, accept this. You've earned it. What's more, you need it. I'm not going to have you humiliating me in front of Sullivan. Besides, I already paid for it, and I'm not getting my money back. Right, Marco? He called behind him. Right, said Marco immediately. Oh, leave it, Jude, Harold said when he saw him about to speak. I've got to go. And then he marched out without looking back.
and so he found himself standing before the triple leaf mirror, watching the reflection of Marco busying about his ankles, but when Marco reached up to his leg to measure the inseam, he flinched reflexively. Easy, easy, Marco said, as if he were a nervous horse, and patted his thigh, also as if he were a horse, and when he gave another involuntary half-kick as Marco did the other leg. Hey, I have pins in my mouth, you know? I'm sorry, he said, and held himself still. When Marco was finished, he looked at himself in his new suit. Here was such anonymity, such protection. Even if someone were to accidentally grace his back, he was wearing en enough layers so that they'd never be able to feel the ridges of scars beneath. Everything was covered. Everything was hidden. If he was standing still, he could be anyone, someone blank and invisible. I think maybe half an inch more, Marco said, pinching the back of the jacket around the waist. He swatted some threads off his sleeve. Now all you need's a good haircut. He found Harold waiting for him in the tie area, reading a magazine. Are you done? He asked, as the entire trip had been his idea, and Harold had been the one indulging his whimsy. Over their early dinner, he tried to thank Harold again, but every time he tried, Harold stopped him with increasing impatience. Has anyone ever told you that sometimes you just need to accept things, Jude? He finally asked. You said to never just accept anything, he reminded Harold. That's in the classroom and in the courtroom, Harold said. Not in life. You see, Jude, in life, sometimes nice things happen to good people. You don't need to worry. They don't happen as often as they should. But when they do, it's up to the good people to say thank you and move on and maybe consider that the person who's doing the nice things gets a bang out of it as well and really isn't in the mood to hear all the reasons that the person for whom he's done the nice thing doesn't think he deserves it or isn't worthy of it. He shut up then, and after dinner, he let Harold drive him back to his apartment on Hereford Street. Besides, Harold said as he was getting out of the car, You looked really, really nice. You're a great-looking kid. I hope someone's told you that before. And then, before he could protest, Acceptance, Jude. So he swallowed what he was going to say. Thank you, Harold, for everything. You're very welcome, Jude, said Harold. I'll see you Monday. He stood on the sidewalk and watched Harold's car drive away, and then went up to his apartment, which was on the second floor of a brownstone adjacent to an MIT fraternity house. The brownstone's owner, a retired sociology professor, lived on the ground floor and leased out the remaining three floors to graduate students. On the top floor were Santosh and Federico, who were getting their doctorates in electrical engineering at MIT, and on the third floor were Jansus and Isidore, who were both PhD candidates at Harvard. Jansus in biochemistry and Isidore in Near Eastern religions, and directly below them were he and his roommate, Charlie Ma, whose real name was Ching Ming Ma, and whom everyone called CM. CM was an intern at Tufts Medical Center, and they kept almost entirely opposite schedules. He would wake and CM's door would be closed, and he would hear his wet, snuffly snores, and when he returned home in the evenings at 8, after working with Harold, CM would be gone. What he saw of CM he liked. He was from Tepe and had gone to boarding school in Connecticut and had a sleepy, roguish grin that made you want to smile back at him, and he was a friend of Andy's friend, which was how they had met. Despite his perpetual air of stone languor, CM was tidy as well, and liked to cook. He'd come home sometimes and find a plate of fried dumplings in the center of the table with a note beneath that read, Eat me, or, occasionally, receive a text instructing him to rotate the chicken in its marinade before he went to bed, or asking him to pick up a bunch of cilantro on his way home. He always would, and would return to find the chicken simmered into a stew or the cilantro minced and folded into scallop pancakes. Every few months or so, when their schedules intersected, all six of them would meet in Santosh and Federico's apartment. Theirs was the largest, and eat and play poker. Jansus and Isidore would worry aloud that girls thought they were gay because they were always hanging out with each other. Siem cut his eyes toward him. He had bet him $20 that they were sleeping together, but were trying to pretend they were straight. At any rate, an impossible thing to prove, and Santosh and Federico would complain about how stupid their students were, and about how the quality of MIT undergraduates had really gone downhill since their time there five years ago. His and CM's was the smallest of apartments, because the landlord had annexed half of the floor to make a storage room.
CM paid significantly more of the rent, so he had the bedroom. He occupied a corner of the living room, the part with the bay window. His bed was a floppy foam egg carton pallet, and his books were lined up under the windowsill, and he had a lamp and a folding paper screen to give him some privacy. He and CM had bought a large wooden table, which they placed in the dining room al alcove, and which had two metal folding chairs, one discarded from Jensu's and another from Federico. One half of the table was his, the other half CM's, and both halves were stacked with books and papers and their laptops, both emitting their chirps and burbles throughout the day and night. People were always stunned by the apartment's bleakness, but he had mostly ceased to notice it, although not entirely. Now, for example, he sat on the floor before the three cardboard boxes in which he stored his clothes and lifted his new sweaters and shirts and socks and shoes from their envelopes of white tissue paper, placing them in his lap one at a time. They were the nicest things he had ever owned, and it seemed somehow shameful to put them in boxes meant to hold file folders. And so finally, he rewrapped them and returned them carefully to their shopping bags. The generosity of Harold's gift unsettled him. First, there was the matter of the gift itself. He had never, never received anything so grand. Second, there was the impossibility of ever adequately repaying him. And third, there was the meaning behind the gesture. He had known for some time that Harold respected him and even enjoyed his company. But was it possible that he was someone important to Harold, that Harold liked him more than as just a student, but as a real, actual friend? And if that was the case, Why should it make him so self-conscious? It had taken him many months to feel truly comfortable around Harold, not in the classroom or in his office, but outside of the classroom, outside of the office. In life, as Harold would say, he would return home after dinner at Harold's house and feel a flush of relief. He knew why, too, as much as he didn't want to admit to himself. Traditionally, men, adult men, which he didn't yet consider himself among, had been interested in him for one reason, and so he had learned to be frightened of them. But Harold didn't seem to be one of those men, although Brother Look hadn't seemed to be one of those men either. He was frightened of everything, it sometimes seemed, and he hated that about himself, fear and hatred, fear and hatred. Often, it seemed that those two were the only two qualities he possessed, fear of everyone else, hatred of himself. He had known Harold before he met him, for Harold was known. He was a relentless questioner. Every remark you made in his class would be seized upon and pecked at in an unending volley of whys. He was trim and tall, and had a way of pacing in a tight circle, his torso pitched forward, when he was engaged or excited. To his disappointment, there was much he simply couldn't remember from that first year contracts class with Harold. He couldn't remember, for example, the specifics of the paper he wrote that interested Harold and which led to conversations with him outside the classroom and, eventually, to an offer to become one of his research assistants. He couldn't remember anything particularly interesting he said in class, but he could remember Harold on that first day of the semester, pacing and pacing and lecturing them in his low, quick voice. You're one else, Harold had said, and congratulations, all of you. As one else, you'll be taking a pretty typical course load. Contracts, torts, property, civil procedure, and next year, constitutional and criminal law. But you know all of this. What you may not know is that this course load reflects beautifully, simply, the very structure of our society. The very mechanics of what a society, our particular society, needs to make it work. To have a society, you first need an institutional framework. That's constitutional law. You need a system of punishment. That's criminal. You need to know that you have a system in place that will make those other systems work. That's civil procedure. You need a way to govern matters of domain and ownership. That's property. You need to know that someone will be financially accountable for injuries caused you by others. That's torts. And finally, you need to know that people will keep their agreements, that they will honor their promises. And that is contracts. He paused. Now, I don't want to be reductive. But I'll bet half of you are here so you can someday wheedle money out of people. Torts people. There is nothing to be ashamed of. And the other half of you are here because you think you're going to change the world. You're here because you dream of arguing before the Supreme Court. Because you think the real challenge of the law lies in the blank spaces between the lines of the Constitution.
but I'm here to tell you it doesn't. The truest, the most intellectually engaging, the richest field of the law is contracts. Contracts are not just sheets of paper promising you a job or a house or an inheritance. In its purest, truest, broadest sense, contracts govern every realm of law. When we choose to live in a society, we choose to live under a contract and to abide by its rule that a contract dictates for us. The Constitution itself is a contract, albeit a malleable contract, and the question of just how malleable it is, exactly, is where a law intersects with politics. And it is under the rules, explicit or otherwise, of this contract that we promise not to kill, and to pay our taxes, and to not steal. But in this case, we are both the creators of, and bound by this contract. As citizens of this country, we have assumed, from birth, an obligation to respect and follow its terms, and we do so daily. In this class, you will of course learn the mechanics of contracts, how one is created, how one is broken, how binding one is, and how to unbind yourself from one. But you will also be asked to consider law itself as a series of contracts. Some are more fair, and this one time will allow you to say such a thing, than others. But fairness is not the only, or even the most important, consideration in law. The law is not always fair. Contracts are not fair. Not always. But sometimes they are necessary. These unfairnesses, because they are necessary for the proper functioning of society. In this class, you will learn the difference between what is fair and what is just, and, as important, between what is fair and what is necessary. You will learn about the obligations we have to one another as members of society, and how far society should go in enforcing those obligations. You will learn to see your life, all of our lives, as a series of agreements, and it will make you rethink not only the law, but this country itself, and your place in it. He had been thrilled by Harold's speech, and in the coming weeks, by how differently Harold thought, by how he would stand at the front of the room like a conductor, stretching out a student's argument into strange and unimaginable formations. Once, a fairly benign discussion about the right to privacy, both the most cherished and the foggiest of constitutional rights, according to Harold, whose definition of contracts often ignored conventional boundaries and bounded happily into other fields of law, had led to an argument between the two of them about abortion, which he felt was indefensible on moral grounds but necessary on social ones. Aha, Harold had said. He was one of the few professors who would entertain not just legal arguments but moral ones. And, Mr. St. Francis, what happens when we forsake morals in law for social governance? What is the point at which a country and its people should start valuing social control over its sense of morality? Is there such a point? I'm not convinced there is. But he had hung in, and the class had stilled around them, watching the two of them debate back and forth. Harold was the author of three books, but it was his last, The American Handshake, The Promises and Failures of the Declaration of Independence, that had made him famous. The book, which he had read even before he met Harold, was a legal interpretation of the Declaration of Independence, which of its promises had been kept and which had not, and were it written today, would it be able to withstand the trends of contemporary jurisprudence? Short answer, no, read the Times Review. Now he was researching his fourth book, a sequel of sorts to the American Handshake, about the Constitution from a similar perspective. But only the Bill of Rights and the sexier amendments, Harold told him when he was interviewing him for the research assistant position. I didn't know some were sexier than the others, he said. Of course some are sexier than others, said Harold. Only the 11th, 12th, 14th, and 16th are sexy. The rest are basically the dross of politics past. The 13th is garbage? He asked, enjoying himself. I didn't say it was garbage, Harold said. Just not sexy. But I think that's what dross means. Harold sighed dramatically, grabbed the dictionary off his desk, flipped it open, and studied it for a moment. Okay, fine he said, tossing it back onto a heap of papers, which slid toward the edge of the surface. The third definition. But I meant the first definition. The leftovers, the detritus, the remains of politics past. Happy? Yes, he said, trying not to smile. He began working for Harold on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday afternoons and evenings, when his course load was lightest. On Tuesdays and Thursdays, he had afternoon seminars at MIT, where he was getting his master's and worked in the law library at night. And on Saturdays, he worked in the library in the morning and in the afternoons at a bakery called Batter, 
which was near the medical college, where he had worked since he was an undergraduate and where he fulfilled speciality orders, decorating cookies and making hundreds of sugar paste flower petals for cakes and experimenting with different recipes, one of which a ten nut cake had become the bakery's bestseller. He worked at Batter on Sundays as well, and one day Allison, the bakery's owner, who entrusted him with many of the more complicated projects, handed him an order form for three dozen sugar cookies decorated to look like various kinds of bacteria. I thought you of all people might be able to figure this out, she said. The customer wife's a microbiologist, and he wants to surprise her in her lab. I'll do some research, he said, taking the page from her and noting the customer's name, Harold Stein. So he had, asking CM and Jinsus for their advice, and had made cookies shaped like paisleys, like maize balls, like cucumbers, using different color frosting to draw their cytoplasms and plasma membranes and ribosomes and fashioning flagella from strands of licorice. He typed up a list, identifying each, and folded it into the box before closing it and tying it with twine. He didn't know Harold very well then, but he liked the idea of making something for him, of impressing him, even if anonymously. And he liked wondering what the cookies were meant to celebrate, a publication, an anniversary, or was it simple luxuriousness? Was Harold Stein the sort of person who showed up at his wife's lab with cookies for no reason? He suspected he perhaps was. The following week, Harold told him about the amazing cookies he'd gotten at Batter. His enthusiasm, which just a few hours ago in class had been directed at the Uniform Commercial Code, had found a new subject in the cookies. He sat biting the inside of his cheek so he wouldn't smile, listening to Harold talk about how genius they'd been and how Julius Lab had been struck speechless by their detail and verisimilitude, and how he had been, briefly, the hero of the lab. Not an easy thing to be with those people, by the way, who secretly think everyone involved in the humanities is something of a moron. Sounds like those cookies were made by a real obsessive, he said. He hadn't told Harold he worked at Batter, and didn't plan on doing so either. Then that's an obsessive I'd like to meet, said Harold. They were delicious, too. Mmm, he said, and thought of a question to ask Harold so he wouldn't keep talking about the cookies. Harold had other research assistants, of course. Two second years and a third year he knew only by sight, but their schedules were such that they never overlapped. Sometimes they communicated with one another by notes or email, explaining where they'd left off in their research so the next person could pick it up and carry it forward. But by the second semester of his first year, Harold had assigned him to work exclusively on the Fifth Amendment. That's a good one, he said, incredibly sexy. The two second-year assistants were assigned the Ninth Amendment, and the third year, the Tenth. And as much as he knew it was ridiculous, he couldn't help but feel triumphant, as if he'd been favored with something the others hadn't. The first invitation to dinner at Harold's house had been spontaneous, at the end of one cold and dark March afternoon. Are you sure? he asked, tentative. Harold had looked at him curiously. Of course, he said. It's just dinner. You have to eat, right? Harold lived in a three-story house in Cambridge, at the edge of the undergraduate campus. I didn't know you lived here, he said as Harold pulled into the driveway. This is one of my favorite streets. I used to walk down it every day as a shortcut to the other side of the campus. You and everybody else, Harold replied. When I bought it just before I got divorced, all these houses were occupied by grad students. All the shutters were falling off. The smell of pot was so thick you could get stoned just by driving by. It was snowing just lightly, but he was grateful that there were only two steps leading up to the door and that he wouldn't have to worry about slipping or needing Harold's help. Inside, the house smelled of butter and pepper and starch. Pasta, he thought. Harold dropped his briefcase on the floor and gave him a vague tour. Living room, study behind it, kitchen, and dining room to your left. And he met Julia, who was tall like Harold, with short brown hair, and whom he liked instantly. Jude, she said, finally, I've heard so much about you. I'm so happy to be meeting you at last. It sounded, he thought, like she really was. Over dinner, they talked. Julia was from an academic family from Oxford and had lived in America since graduate school at Stanford. She and Harold had met five years ago through a friend. Her lab studied a new virus that appeared to be a variant of H5N1 and were trying to map its genetic code. 
Isn't one of the concerns in microbiology the potential weaponization of these genomes? He asked, and felt, rather than saw, Harold turn toward him. Yes, that's right. Julia said as she explained to him the controversy surrounding her and her colleague's work, he glanced over at Harold, who was watching him, and who raised an eyebrow at him in a gesture that he couldn't interpret. But then the conversation shifted, and he could almost watch as the discussion moved steadily away from Julia's lab and inexorably toward him, could see how good a lit litigator Harold would be if he wanted to, could see his skill in redirecting and repositioning almost as if the conversation were something liquid as he was guiding it through a series of troughs and shoots, eliminating any options for its escape until it reached its inevitable end. So, Jude, Julie asked, where did you grow up? South Dakota and Montana, mostly, he said, and he could feel the creature inside of him sit up, aware of danger, but unable to escape it. So are your parents ranchers? asked Harold. He had learned over the years to anticipate this sequence of questioning and how to deflect it as well. No, he said. But a lot of people were, obviously. It's beautiful countryside out there. Have you spent any time in the West? Usually this was enough, but it wasn't for Harold. Ha, he said. That's the silkiest pivot I've heard in a long time. Harold looked at him closely enough so that he eventually looked down at his plate. I suppose that's your way of saying you're not going to tell us what they do. Oh, Harold, leave him alone, said Julia but he could feel Harold staring at him, and was relieved when dinner ended. After that first night at Harold's, their relationship became both deeper and more difficult. He felt he had awakened Harold's curiosity, which he imagined as a perked, bright-eyed dog, a terrier, something relentless and keen, and wasn't sure that was such a good thing. He wanted to know Harold better, but over dinner he had been reminded that that process, getting to know someone, was always so much more challenging than he remembered. He always forgot. He was always made to remember. He wished, as often he did, that the entire sequence, the divulging of intimacies, the exploring of past, could be sped past, and that he could be, simply be teleported to the next stage where the relationship was something soft and pliable and comfortable, where both parties' limits were understood and respected. Other people might have made a few more attempts at questioning him, and then left him alone. Other people had left him alone his friends, his classmates, his other professors, but Harold was not easily dissuaded. Even his usual strategies, among them telling his interlocutors that he wanted to hear about their lives, not talk about his, a tactic that had the benefit of being true as well as effective, didn't work with Harold. He never knew when Harold would pounce next, but whenever he did, he was unprepared, and he felt himself becoming more self-conscious, not less, the more time they spent with each other. They would be in Harold's office talking about something, the University of Virginia affirmative action case going before the Supreme Court, say, and Harold would ask, What's your ethnic background, Jude? A lot of things, he would answer, and then would try to change the subject, even if it meant dropping a stack of books to cause a distraction. But sometimes the questions were contextless and random, and these were impossible to anticipate, as they came without preamble. One night, he and Harold were in his office, working late, and Harold ordered them dinner. For dessert, he'd gotten cookies and brownies, and he pushed a paper bag toward him. No thanks, he said. Really? Harold asked, raising his eyebrows. My son used to love these. We tried to bake them for him at home, but we never got the recipe quite right. He broke a brownie in half. Did your parents bake for you a lot when you were a kid? He would ask these questions with a deliberate casualness that he found almost unbearable. No, he said, pretending to review the notes he'd been taking. He listened to Harold chewing, and he knew, considering whether to retreat or continue his line of questioning. Do you see your parents often? Harold asked him abruptly on a different night. They're dead, he said, keeping his eyes on the page. I'm sorry, Jude. Harold said after a silence, and the sincerity in his voice made him look up. Mine are two, relatively recently. Of course, I'm much older than you. I'm sorry, Harold, he said. And then, guessing, you were close to them? I was, said Harold. Very. Were you close to yours? He shook his head. No, not really. Harold was quiet. But I'll bet they were proud of you, he said, finally. Whenever Harold asked him questions about himself, 
He always felt something cold move across him, as if he were being iced from the inside, his organs and nerves being protected by a sheath of frost. In that moment, though, he thought he might break, that if he said anything the ice would shatter and he would splinter and crack. So he waited until he knew he would sound normal before he asked Harold if he needed him to find the rest of the articles now or if he should do it in the morning. He didn't look at Harold, though, and spoke only to his notebook. Harold took a long time to reply. Tomorrow, Harold said, quietly. And he nodded and gathered his things to go home for the night, aware of Harold's eyes following his lurching progress to the door. Harold wanted to know how he had been raised, and if he had any siblings, and who his friends were, and what he did with them. He was greedy for information. At least he could answer the last questions, and he told him about his friends, and how they had met, and where they were. Malcolm in graduate school at Columbia, J.B. and, Mel and Willem at Yale. He liked answering Harold's questions about them, liked talking about them, liked hearing Harold laugh when he told him stories about them. He told him about CM and how Santosh and Federico were in some sort of fight with the engineering undergrads who lived in the frat house next door and how he had awoken one morning to a fleet of motorized dirigibles handmade from condoms floating noisily up past his window up toward the fourth floor, each dangling signs that read, Santosh, Giant, and Federico de Luca have micro penises. But when Harold was asking the other questions, he felt smothered by their weight and frequency and inevitability, and sometimes the air grew so hot with the questions Harold wasn't asking him that it was so oppressive as if he actually had. People wanted to know so much, they wanted so many answers, and he understood it, he did. He wanted answers too, he too wanted to know everything. He was grateful, then, for his friends and for how relatively little they had mined from him. How they had left him to himself, a blank, faceless prairie under whose yellow surface earthworms and beetles wriggled through the black soil and chips of bone calcified slowly into stone. You're really interested in this, he snapped at Harold once, frustrated, when Harold had asked him whether he was dating anyone and then, hearing his tone, stopped and apologized. They had known each other for almost a year by then. This, said Harold, ignoring the apology. I'm interested in you. I don't see what's strange about that. This is the kind of stuff friends talk about with each other. And yet, despite his discomfort, he kept coming back to Harold, kept accepting his dinner invitations, even though at some point in every encounter there would be a moment in which he wished he could disappear, or in which he worried he might have disappointed. One night he went to dinner at Harold's and was introduced to Harold's best friend, Lawrence, whom he had met in law school and who was now an appellate court judge in Boston, and his wife, Gillian, who taught English at Simmons. Jude, said Lawrence, whose voice was even lower than Harold's. Harold tells me you're also getting your master's at MIT. What in? Pure math, he replied. How is that different from, she laughed, regular math? Gillian asked. Well, regular math, or applied math, is what I suppose you could call practical math, he said. It's used to solve problems, to provide solutions, whether it's the realm of economics, or engineering, or accounting, or what have you. But pure math doesn't exist to provide immediate or necessarily obvious practical applications. It's purely an expression of form, if you will. The only thing it proves is the almost infinite elasticity of mathematics itself, within the accepted set of assumptions by which we define it, of course. Do you mean imaginary geometries? Stuff like that? Lawrence asked. It can be, sure. But it's not just that. Often, it's merely proof of, of the impossible yet consistent internal logic of math itself. There's all kinds of specialities within pure math. Geometric pure math, like you said, but also algebraic math algorithmic math, cryptography, information theory, and pure logic, which is what I study. Which is what? Lawrence asked. He thought, mathematical logic, or pure logic, is essentially a conversation between truths and falsehoods. So, for example, I might say to you, all positive numbers are real. Two is a positive number. Therefore, two must be real. But this isn't actually true, right? It's a Derivation, a supposition of truth. I haven't actually proven that 2 is a real number, but it must logically be true. So you'd write a proof to, in essence, 
proof that the logic of those two statements is in fact real and infinitely applicable. He stopped. Does that make sense? Radio ergast, said Lauren suddenly. I see it, therefore it is. He smiled. And that's exactly what applied math is, but pure math is more, he thought again. Imaginar ergoist. Lauren smiled back at him and nodded. Very good, he said. Well, I have a question, said Harold, who'd been quiet, listening to them. How and why on earth did you end up in law school? Everyone laughed, and he did too. He had been asked that question often by Dr. Lee, despairingly, by his master's advisor, Dr. Cashin, perplexedly, and he always changed the answer to suit the audience for the real answer. That he wanted to have the means to protect himself, that he wanted to make sure no one could ever reach him again seemed too selfish and shallow and tiny a reason to say out loud, and would invite a slew of subsequent questions anyway. Besides, he knew enough now to know that the law was a filmsy form of protection. If he really wanted to be safe, he should have become a marksman, squinting through an eyepiece or a chemist in a lab with his pipettes and poisons. That night, though, he said, But law isn't so unlike pure math, really. I mean... It too, in theory, can offer an answer to every question, can't it? Laws of anything are meant to be pressed against and stretched, and if they can't provide solutions to every matter they claim to cover, then they aren't really laws at all, are they? He stopped to consider what he'd just said. I suppose the difference is that in law, there are many paths to many answers. In math, there are many paths to a single answer. And also, I guess that law isn't actually about the truth. It's about governance. But math doesn't have to be convenient or practical or managerial. It only has to be true. What do you mean? asked Harold. Well, he said. In law, we talk about a beautiful summation or a beautiful judgment. And what we mean by that, of course, is the loveliness of not only its logic but its expression. And similarly, in math, when we talk about a beautiful proof, what we're recognizing is the simplicity of the proof. It's elementalness, I suppose. It's inevitability. What about something like Fermat's last theorem? Asked Julia. That's a perfect example of a non-beautiful proof, because while it was important that it was solved, it was, for a lot of people, like my advisor, a disappointment. The proof went on for hundreds of pages and drew from so many disparate fields of mathematics and was so tortured, jigsawed, really, in its execution, that there are still many people at work trying to prove it in more elegant terms, even though it's already been proven. A beautiful proof is succinct, like a beautiful ruling. It combines just a handful of different concepts, albeit from across the mathematical universe, and in a relatively brief series of steps, leads to a grand and new generalized truth in mathematics, that is, a wholly provable and shakable absolute in a constricted world with very unshakable absolutes. He stopped to take a breath, aware suddenly that he had been talking and talking and that the others were silent watching him. He could feel himself flushing, could feel the old hatred fill him like dirty water once more. I'm sorry. He apologized. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to ramble on. Are you joking? Said Lawrence. Jude. I think that was the first truly revelatory conversation I've had in Harold's house in probably the last decade or more. Thank you. Everyone laughed again, and Harold leaned back in his chair, looking pleased. See? He caught Harold mouthing across the table to Lawrence, and Lawrence nodding, and he understood that this was meant about him, and was flattered despite himself, and shy as well. Had Harold talked about him to his friend? Had this been a test for him? A test he hadn't known he was to take? He was relieved he had passed it, and that he hadn't embarrassed Harold, and relieved too that, as uncomfortable as it sometimes made him, he might have fully earned his place in Harold's house, and might be invited back again. With each day he trusted Harold a little more, and at times he wondered if he was making the same mistake again. Was it better to trust, or better to be wary? Could you have a real friendship if some part of you was always expecting betrayal? He felt sometimes as if he was taking advantage of Harold's generosity, his jolly faith in him, and sometimes as if his circumspection was the wise choice after all, for if it should end badly, 
he'd have only himself to blame. But it was difficult to not trust Harold. Harold made it difficult, and, just as important, he was making it difficult for himself. He wanted to trust Harold. He wanted to give in. He wanted the creature inside him to tuck itself into a sleep from which it would never wake. Late one night in his second year of law school, he was at Harold's. And when they opened the door, the steps, the street, the trees were hushed with snow and the flakes cycling toward the door so fast that they both took a step backward. I'll call Cap, he said so Harold wouldn't have to drive him. No, you won't, Harold said. You'll stay here. And so he stayed in Harold and Julia's spare bedroom on the second floor, separated from their room by a large windowed space they used as a library and a brief hallway. Here's a t-shirt, Harold said, lobbing something gray and soft at him. And here's a toothbrush. He placed it on the bookcase. There's extra towels in the bathroom. Do you want anything else? Water? No, he said. Harold, thank you. Of course, Jude. Good night. Good night. He stayed awake for a while, the feather comforter wadded around him, the mattress plush beneath him, watching the window turn white and listening to water glugging from the faucets and Harold and Julia's low, indistinguishable murmurs at each other, and one or the other of them padding from one place to another, and then, finally, nothing. In those minutes, he pretended that they were his parents, and he was home for the weekend from law school to visit them and this was his room, and the next day he would get up and do whatever it was that grown children did with their parents. The summer after that second year, Harold invited him to their house in Truro on Cape Cod. You'll love it, he said. Invite your friends, they'll love it too. And so on Thursday before Labor Day, once his and Malcolm's internships had ended, they all drove up to the house from New York, and for that long weekend, Harold's attention shifted to J.B. and Malcolm and Willem. He watched them too, admiring how they could answer every one of Harold's parries, how generous they were with their own lives, how they could tell stories about themselves that they laughed at, and that made Harold and Julia laugh as well, how comfortable they were around Harold, and how comfortable Harold was around them. He experienced the singular pleasure of watching people he loved fall in love with other people he loved. The house had a private walk down to a private spit of beach, and in the mornings, the four of them would troop downhill and swim. Even if he did, in his pants and undershirt, and an old Oxford shirt, which no one bothered him about, and then lie on the sand baking, the wet clothes ungluing themselves from his body as they dried. Sometimes Harold would come and watch them, or swim as well. In the afternoons, Malcolm and J.B. would pedal off through the dunes on bicycles, and he and Willem would follow on foot, picking up bits of shaly shells and sad carapaces of long-nibbled-away hermit crabs as they went, Willem slowing his pace to match his own. In the evenings, when the air was soft, J.B. and Malcolm sketched, and he and Willem read. He felt doped on sun and food and salt and contentment. And at night, he fell asleep quickly and early, and in the mornings he woke before the others so he could stand on the back porch alone, looking over the sea. What is going to happen to me? He asked the sea. What is happening to me? The holiday ended and the fall semester began, and it didn't take him long to realize that over the weekend one of his friends must have said something to Harold, although he was certain it wasn't Willem, who was the only one to whom he'd finally told something of his past, and even then, not very much at all. Three facts each more slender than the last, all meaningless, all of which combined to, not, to make not even a beginning of a story. Even the first sentences of a fairy tale had more detail than what he had told Willem. Once upon a time, a boy and a girl lived with their father, a woodcutter, and their stepmother, deep in a cold forest. The woodcutter loved his children, but he was very poor, and so one day, dot dot dot, so whatever Harold had learned had been speculation, buttressed by their observations of him, their theories and guesses and fictions. But whatever it was, it had been enough to make Harold's questions to him about he had been and where he had come from stop. As the months and then the years passed, they developed a friendship in which the first fifteen years of his life remained unsaid and unspoken, as they had never happened at all. 
as if he had been removed from the manufacturer's box when he reached college and a switch at the base of his neck had been flipped and he had shuddered to life. He knew that those blank years were filled in by Harold's own imaginings and that some of those imaginings were worse than what had actually happened and some were better. But Harold never told him what he supposed for him and he didn't really want to know. He had never considered their friendship contextual, but he was prepared for the likelihood that Harold and Julia did. And so when he moved to Washington for his clerkship, he assumed that they would forget him, and he tried to prepare himself for the loss. But that didn't happen. Instead, they sent emails and called, and when one or the other was in town, they would have dinner. In the summers, he and his friends visited Truro, and over Thanksgiving they went to Cambridge. And when he moved to New York, two years later to begin his job at the U.S. Attorney's Office, Harold had been almost alarmingly excited for him. They had even offered to let him live in their apartment on the Upper West Side, but he knew they used it often, and he wasn't sure how real their offer was, and so he declined. Every Saturday, Harold would call and ask him about work, and he'd tell him about his boss, Marshall, the deputy U.S. attorney, who had the unnerving ability to recite entire Supreme Court decisions from memory, closing his eyes to summon a vision of the page in his mind, his voice becoming robotic and dull as he chanted, but never dropping or adding a word. He had always thought he had a good memory, but Marshall's amazed him. In some ways, the U.S. Attorney's Office reminded him of the home. It was largely male, and the place fizzed with a particular and constant hostility, the kind of hissing acrimony that naturally arises whenever a group of highly competitive people who are all evenly matched are housed in the same small space with the understanding that only some of them would have the opportunity to distinguish themselves. Here, though, they were matched in accomplishments. At the home, they were matched in hunger in want. All 200 of the assistant prosecutors, it seemed, had attended one of five or six law schools, and virtually all of them had been on the law review and moot court at their respective schools. He was part of a four-person team that worked mostly on security fraud cases, and he and his teammates each had something, a credential in idiosyncrasy, that they hoped lifted them above the others. He had his master's from MIT, which no one cared about but was at least an oddity, and his circuit court clerkship with Sullivan, with whom Marshall was friendly. Citizen, his closest friend at the office, had a law degree from Cambridge, and he had practiced as a barrister in London for two years before moving to New York. And Rhodes, the third in their trio, had been a Fulbright scholar in Argentina after college. The four on their team was a profoundly lazy guy named Scott who, it was rumored, had only gotten the job because his father played tennis with the president. He was usually at the office, and sometimes when he and Citizen and Rhodes were there late, eating takeout, he was reminded of being with his roommates in their suite at Hood. And although he enjoyed Citizen's and Rhodes' company and the specificity and depth of their intelligence, he was in those moments nostalgic for his friends, who thought so differently than he did, and who made him think differently as well. In the middle of one conversation with Citizen and Rhodes about logic, he recalled, suddenly, a question Dr. Lee had asked him his freshman year, when he was auditioning to be accepted into his pure math seminar. Why are manhole covers round? It was an easy question, and easy to answer, but when he returned to Hood and had repeated Dr. Lee's question to his roommates, they were silent. And then finally J.B. had begun, in the dreamy tones of a wandering storyteller. Once, very long ago, mammoths roamed the earth, and their footprints left permanent circular indentations in the ground. And they had all laughed. He smiled, remembering it. He sometimes wished he had a mind like J.B.'s, one that could create stories that would delight others, instead of the mind he did have, which was always searching for an explanation, an explanation that, while perhaps correct, was empty of romance, of fancy, of wit. Time to whip out the credentials. Citizen would whisper to him on the occasion that the U.S. attorney himself would emerge onto the floor and all the assistant prosecutors would bust toward him, moth-like, as a multitude of gray suits. They and Rhodes would join the hover, but even in those gatherings he never mentioned the one credential he knew could have made not only Marshall but the U.S. attorney as well stop and look at him more closely.
After he'd gotten the job, Harold had asked him if he could mention him to Adam, the U.S. attorney with whom Harold was, it happened, long-time acquaintances. But he'd told Harold he wanted to know he could make it on his own. This was true, but the greater reason was that he was tentative about naming Harold as one of his assets because he didn't want Harold to regret his association with him. And so he'd said nothing. Often, however, it felt as if Harold was there anyway, reminiscing about law school and its attendant activity bragging about one's accomplishments in law school was a favorite pastime in the office, and because so many of his colleagues had gone to his school, quite a few of them knew Harold, and the others knew of him, and he'd sometimes listen to them talk about classes they'd taken with him, or how prepared they'd had to be for them, and would feel proud of Harold, and, though he knew it was silly, proud of himself for knowing him. The following year, Harold's book about the Constitution would be published and everyone in the office would read the acknowledgments and see his name and his affiliation with Harold would be revealed, and many of them would be suspicious, and he'd see worry in their faces as they tried to remember what they might have said about Harold in his presence. By that time, however, he would feel he had established himself in the office on his own, had found his own place alongside Citizen and Rhodes, had made his own relationship with Marshall. But as much as he would have liked to, as much as he craved it, he was still cautious about claiming Harold as his friend. Sometimes he worried that he was only imagining their closeness, inflating it hopefully in his mind. And then, to his embarrassment, he would have to retrieve the beautiful promise from his shelf and turn the acknowledgments, reading Harold's words again as if it were itself a contract, a declaration that what he felt for Harold was at least in some degree reciprocated. And yet he was always prepared. It will end this month, he would tell himself. And then, at the end of the month, next month. He won't talk to me the next month. He tried to keep himself in a constant state of readiness. He tried to prepare himself for disappointment, even as he yearned to be proven wrong. And still, the friendship spooled on and on, a long, swift river that had caught him in its slipstream and was carrying him along, taking him somewhere he couldn't see. At every point when he thought that he had reached the limits of what their relationship would be, Harold or Julia flung open the doors to another room and invited him in. He met Julia's father, a retired pulmonologist and brother, an art history professor, when they visited from England one Thanksgiving and when Harold and Julia came to New York, they took him and Willem out to dinner, to places they had heard about but couldn't afford to visit on their own. They saw the apartment at Lisbonard Street, Julia polite, Harold horrified. And the week that the radiators mysteriously stopped working, they left him a set of keys to their apartment uptown, which was so warm that for the first hour he and Willem arrived, they simply sat on a sofa like manne mannequins, too stunned by the sudden reintroduction of heat into their lives to move. And after Harold witnessed him in the middle of an episode, this was the Thanksgiving after he moved to New York, and in his desperation, he knew he wouldn't be able to make it upstairs. He had turned off the stove, for he had been sautéing some spinach, and pulled himself into the pantry, where he had shut the door and laid on the floor to wait. They had rearranged the house, so that the next time he visited, he found the spare bedroom had been moved to the ground floor suite behind the living room where Harold's study had been, and Harold's desk and chair and books moved to the second floor. But even after all of this, a part of him was always waiting for the day he'd come to a door and try the knob, and it wouldn't move. He didn't mind that, necessarily. There was something scary and anxiety-inducing about being in a space where nothing seemed to be forbidden to him, where everything was offered to him and nothing was asked in return. He tried to give them what he could. He was aware it wasn't much. And the things Harold gave him, so easily, answers, affection, he couldn't reciprocate. One day, after he'd known them for almost seven years, he was at the house in springtime. It was Julia's birthday. She was turning 51. And because she had been at a conference in Oslo for her 50th birthday, she decided that this would be her big celebration. He and Harold were cleaning the living room, or rather, he was cleaning, and Harold was plucking books at random from the shelves and telling him stories about how he'd gotten each one, or flipping back the covers so he could see other people's names written inside, including a copy of The Leopard 
on whose flyleaf was scrawled property of Lawrence B. Riley. Do not take. Harold Stein, this means you. He had threatened to tell Lawrence, and Harold had threatened him back. You'd better not, Jude, if you know what's good for you. Or what? He'd asked, teasing him. Or this, Harold had said, and had leaped at him, and before he could recognize that Harold was just being playful, he had recoiled so violently, torquing his body to avoid contact, that he had bumped into the bookcase and had knocked against a lumpy ceramic mug that Harold's son Jacob had made, which fell to the ground and broke into three neat pieces. Harold had stepped back from him then, and there was a sudden, horrible silence into which he had nearly wept. Harold, he said, crouching to the ground, picking up the pieces. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. Please forgive me. He wanted to beat himself against the floor. He knew this was the last thing Jacob had made Harold before he got sick. Above him, he could hear only Harold's breathing. Harold, please forgive me, he repeated, cupping the pieces in his palms. I think I can fix this, though. I can make it better. He couldn't look up from the mug, its shiny buttered glaze. He felt Harold crouch beside him. Jude, Harold said, It's all right. It was an accident. His voice was very quiet. 